You're awesome, Lord.
Glory to God. Good morning, Royal Oak Church. Good morning. How are we doing today? That was some good music. That was good. some good worship. It's always good. But Glory to God. It always is, but that was some good stuff. How are we doing Sunday morning? Good to have everybody here at church today. Welcome to those who are with us today, and as well, those who may be joining us on Facebook Live or YouTube. It's great to have everybody. Um, looks like when I got back from Florida, I brought some warm weather with me this week. You, can, you guys can all thank me after service. Good job. I heard, it, I heard we had some snow flurries last weekend. Is that true? Some snow flurries. I came back and it was 70 degrees. All is well now. It's supposed to be a nice day today. Go ahead and out there and enjoy it, whatever it is you're going to do. But we just have a few announcements that we're going to make today. We have some key events that are coming up. One's going to be our Millstone Ministry Seminar. That's going to be Saturday, April 27th. We have a signed-up sheet over there. This is going to be age-appropriate for teens on ups, not small children. We're going to learn a little bit more about human trafficking and, again, how to be a part of the solution, things to recognize and identify, uh, and maybe separating myth from fact as it pertains to that issue. So if that's something that you're interested in, uh, we would ask you to sign up. You, there's a QR code on the flyer. Or you can, I think you can just put your name down as well, but we'd like to get you um, there for that if that's something that would interest you. Security team, we've got one person who signed up, maybe, a, um, maybe one other that's interested. We're still looking for a couple other people that could help with that. We want to make sure that we are keeping our facilities safe, that we're keeping a good eye on our children, and um, really we just need some eyes and ears in the church that can help be a part of that. So when people come in, they know that their kids are going to be well taken care of, and um, just our church body on a whole, that we're alert to what's happening around us. Uh, young adults are having a gathering Saturday, April 20th, which is, I guess, this coming Saturday. Time's already flying. So they're going to meet at the Glambus house. Their uh, address is in there. And there's going to be food and games. We want you to be a part of that. Think ahead now. Before you know it, it's going to be summertime. We want you to think ahead for VBS. So, yeah, we got, we got to give it up for VBS. I heard a little, little whoop in there. Give it up for VBS. Uh, that's going to be June 26th through 28th. So we always are looking for volunteers for that. Um, we've been doing VBS on and off over the years. It's a great ministry for our young kids and kids in the neighborhood. So if that is something that you would be interested in helping out with, again, you can sign up. You can talk to Pastor Brian back there. Um, give it up for Pastor Brian. Did a great job last week. And, uh, always great when he can share in the pulpit. We appreciate all of his great work here. So if you could help support him with VBS and uh, volunteering for that, we'd appreciate that. If you're visiting with us today, we've got a little welcome gift for you, and we'll even send it to you if you're joining us for the first time on Facebook Live or YouTube. We're glad to have you with us here at Rock. We're going to pray in just a moment for our, this week's offering. And at this time, we'll also, because I always forget, I think I remember one out of every four times, but I'm going to remember even before I pray, look how impressed I am with myself, we will let our kids go to Children's Church at this time. So if any kids that are here want to go be a part of Children's Church, you can follow Pastor Brian, and we will let you guys out now. Enjoy yourselves. And at this time, we'll pray for our offering. As I always say, if anybody is visiting with us today for the first time or new in general, uh, you just be our guest. We're not expecting anything from you. Uh, but if you want to give, for anybody who's here and wants to give, you can give in the giving box in the corner of our worship center on the little table over there, or you can give online at rochurch.org. We want to make sure that we are continuing to be faithful to God's ministry. We want to make sure that we're meeting our ministry obligations, not just for our existing obligations, but that we can continue to expand what we're doing in the community so that we can make, continue to make a positive impact. With that, let's bow our heads and pray, and we will have a little video and then hand this back over to the praise team. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you have so generously given to us. We ask, Lord, that this offering will be blessed and be multiplied, that um, our church, like many others, we kind of look at things throughout the year, and sometimes it can get a little stressful, but you always provide, God, and you provide through our obedience as well. So we ask, God, uh, that we would be uh, faithful to our, our church and the ministries that we have before us so that we can continue to live out our core values and meet the needs of people in our community here in Royal Oak and in surrounding communities. We pray this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. I am nothing, I am without, nothing you. without you. I cannot live, I cannot live without you. I cannot, I cannot breathe without you. Without you. Without you. 
without you. Without you, I am nothing. I have no purpose. I have no purpose. At least, at least that's how I feel. I mean, I mean what's it like to be, stuck, like on to be stuck on top of a mountain, mountain where there's beautiful scenery, scenery but no air to breathe? No one to fill, no your, one to fill your lungs with destiny. No one to give you, no one to give you hope to hold on to. No one to hold you close when everyone leaves. It's just you, forgotten, alone. You work day to day, but you know that something's missing. You go back, retrace your steps, and find that you left something behind. That maybe back on that path, there's something you miss. Someone who tried to call you, someone who tried to text, someone you just ignored. You hung a do not disturb sign on the door of your heart. And let it rust, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, return to the earth you must. And I know that this is daunting, weighing on your shoulders like a heavy weight. But someone carried your mistakes, and your life was valued by him. And even though you haven't given him the time of day, he's been waiting for you. Waiting for you to accept what he did for you. Waiting for you to realize that you can't do this thing on your own. Waiting for you to know that your money or even your family can't save you. It boils down to just you. I cannot breathe without you, without you. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of all praise. If you would like to stand and we can continue to praise and worship an awesome God and Lord. <coughs> Thank you. 
to God. Can we get you to get your hands together? Let's make some noise. Father, we come to you right now and we give you praise and we give you thanks. You are a God of miracles. You are the God most high. You give us strength. You give us hope. You give us grace. You give us mercy. 
Right now, we live in a world that needs hope. So many different corners of the world. The world just seems to be on fire right now. We see right before us wars and rumors of wars and a whole region of the Middle East on, on, on the brink. In other parts of the world where hostilities are raging. And it certainly can be scary from where we're at to see what's transpiring, but all the more terrifying for those that are caught in the middle of it. So we want to pray for the innocent people on the various sides of these conflicts that are caught in the middle. But we pray that your will would be done. We pray, Father, that you would protect your people and that you would humble the enemies of your people. We pray that as believers that we would be ambassadors of hope and strength in this world that we live in. I pray that we here at Royal Oak Church would be ambassadors of, of hope and good news right here in our community, here in Royal Oak and the surrounding communities that we minister to. I pray that we would be a church that lives out the gospel, the good news, and the distinctive core values of our church. May those who are looking for something greater than themselves, may they find it in the gospel. May they find it in Jesus Christ. And if it is your will, may this be the church that is the one that ministers to them. But if not here, then somewhere where they can hear the good news. We pray for this service before us today that we would learn from your word, that we would be encouraged. I pray for everybody here today with whatever might be going on in their own lives, that you would speak to us individually. And may we renew our hope in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Drifted away. I have drifted away. I was distracted. I was distracted. And lost sight and of lost shore. sight of the shore. The waves keep the waves keep larger. growing larger. I thought I could navigate, I thought I could this, navigate myself. this myself. Without you, without I you, have I have grown tired and weary. I must realign. I must realign my compass Christ toward Christ once more. The pages of the pages of Scripture become my map, leading me through, leading the, tumultuous me through the tumultuous waters. With dedicated with time dedicated spent time with God. Spent with God I feel the waters start to recede. I remind myself, I remind who, my myself who my God is. He calls himself, he calls himself the, mighty God, the mighty God, the Creator, the Creator, Father, Father, the God most, the God high, most high, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace the, beginning and the beginning and the end. Lord, I repent, Lord, I repent of my sin and selfish ways. ways. Just as, a ship Just as a ship needs a captain, my life requires, my life the, requires guidance the guidance of a Savior. Christ is the Christ anchor, is the anchor that, holds firm, that holds me firm, preventing me, preventing from, me from drifting aimlessly. It's through Him, it's through that, him I'm that I'm guided safety. back to safety. And no matter how, many, no matter how many times I drift away, I know God, I know is, calling God is calling me home. Open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. Isaiah 40, verses 27 through 31. And our, me <clears throat> our message entitled today, Soaring on Eagle Wings. We're going to do a couple standalone messages this week before we enter into a new sermon series next month. Can you guys see me while it's a little dark up here? Can you guys get a little light? A little light? Excellent. All right. I like eagles. They're very cool. I wouldn't want to have an encounter with one necessarily. They're known to be kind of, t they're cool to look at. But uh, I had, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a, a paranoia about birds, but Little Bill and I, when we were in Florida last week, we were just walking, and I think we almost got a bird attack, didn't we, Little Bill? Young Bill, I should say. And um, those of you that have been around me long enough, you know I don't necessarily have the most tough masculine scream in the world. And just yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the day before I was at my own house, and I'm walking up to my front door, and I was 
disturbing some bird who was just chilling on my front porch, and I didn't see it, and I walk in, and this thing just comes at me like some angry, and I let out the, ah, you know, one of those deals. And then I said, oh, no, I mean, ah, stay away from me. But eagles are cool. They are, are you know, a prominent bird for our state, you know, and you, you see one, they're, they're pretty majestic. You've got, how many people have ever seen an eagle fly through the sky? Pretty cool, isn't it? And the notion of soaring on eagle wings is great imagery that we see in Scripture. And we're going to look at today, the theme of our message is the God of the possible. And let me set a little background for our passage today. Um, there, is, there is a big gap between Isaiah 39 and 40. Isaiah 39 ends with the Babylonian captivity that is taking place. And you've got to fast forward about 150 years before we get to Isaiah 40. So the people are in captivity. They're, they're having a rough time. And they're looking for what is the, you know, what's going on with the promise of God, our restoration. We're waiting. We're waiting on him. When's it going to happen? And generations are passing by, whole generations. Several generations are passing by. And if you don't know the background, you'll miss that in the book, that between chapter 30 and chapter 40, there's a long period of time that takes place. So now we get to chapter 40, and if you go on through Isaiah, you see there's a lot of judgment passages against the people. They're getting ready for this captivity that's going to be taking place. Then we get to chapter 40, and now suddenly we have a message of comfort that's taking place. In fact, chapter 40 begins by saying, Comfort, comfort my people. Says to your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her. Without going into too much detail this week, I had to speak uh, pretty directly to somebody I love this week. And it pained me to do that. I'm not going to go into all the details. It pained me to do that. But as I kind of calmed down a little bit uh, afterwards and saw that the person was taking some good necessary steps, you know, my attitude shifted from one of, you know, you got to come down. Sometimes love's got to be tough. Amen, right? You know, sometimes love's got to be tough. But when we shift to, you know, the whole point of tough love is wanting to build somebody up ultimately, to, to see them be restored and then to see comfort and grace be dispensed. You know, that should be our goal. And that's how God frequently deals with his people. Sometimes he had to just kind of rattle his people a little bit because they were going astray. They were going the wrong way. He, they were doing all the things that he warned them not to do. And if you know your biblical theology, you go all the way to the Pentateuch, you look at Leviticus and Deuteronomy, there is this blessing and cursing formula for the Jewish people, and where the people were told that if they follow the covenant of God, that they would be blessed. But if they were disobedient to the covenant of God, ultimately it would result in their own exile. And that is what took place with the northern kingdom in 722 BC. The northern kingdom of Israel, 10 of the tribes, were taken into exile by the Assyrian Empire. About 150 or so years later, the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into exile by the Babylonians, and that's where we have chapter 39 taking place. But that wasn't the last chapter for the, for the, uh, for the, the Jewish people at that time. They were going to be taken into captivity, but then they would ultimately be able to return to their land to rebuild the temple, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And there was a 70-year period of rebuilding that took place. And the temple would once again stand. The sacrifices would resume. And though that they were living under captivity, God continues to give his people a lifeline. He continues to preserve them. And he preserves them for another six centuries, ultimately leading up to the birth of the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ. But if you were a Jewish person in the 500s B.C. sitting under the thumb of Babylonian captivity, you're asking yourself, what is my future? What is going to happen to us? But they had to turn to the God of the possible. And with the God of the possible, we 
frequently will put God in a box and limit him of what is possible for us. We will sell ourselves short as people. We'll sell ourselves short as believers. Churches will sell themselves short. Because sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed and say, oh, especially if you were living in back then in Babylonian captivity, you're going to say to yourself, what, do I, what am I going to do with all this? You know, we were promised a kingdom. Our kingdom is done. Now we serve these foreign pagan overlords. We have no hope. We have no future. But in this latter portion of Isaiah from chapters 40 to the end of the book, it spells out a picture of hope for the Jewish people. And those who are so weary and living through this constant turmoil. And you can certainly see parallels in parts of the world today. People who are just living with constant turmoil. That there is hope through the God of the possible. Despite all the mess that might be going on around them. So that's a little bit about the context. And the whole chapter is very interesting. I you know, introduced a couple passages in the beginning, but we're going to look specifically at verses 27 through 31, so read along with me if you will. Isaiah writes, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us today, particularly those who might feel weary themselves. May we find hope and renewed strength in you. May you speak to us collectively as a church, and may you speak to us as individuals. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one that I'm going to look at from verse 22nd, uh, 22nd, 27, recognizing our need for him. It is easy for people at times to neglect their need for God when everything seems to be going okay. One of the objections that I've heard over the years from different people about Christianity, faith, is that, well, that's for, that's for weak people. That's for people who, you know, maybe they're, they're going through something big or they're having financial issues or physical issues or, you know, they just need something in life. And I'll respond to that, that, you know, first of all, we all need something in life. But it, there's nothing surprising about the fact that sometimes when we are in a state where we realize how dependent we really are, of course, we're going to be more aware at that time. The danger, however, is when somebody has their health, when somebody has great wealth, when somebody's got great family around them, when somebody just seems to be, things are just okay in the immediate sense. But yet these same individuals will realize at some point that there's a void but not be aware of what that void actually is. So when things are, quote, good, it can be deceptive if it, convinces us that we don't need God right now. But of course, if we're going through some struggle, we're going to recognize that we have a, a need, a dependence for him. And the Jewish people at this time, we're going to be very aware of that. I mean, there's some major theological ramifications of what just took place. The kingdom was overthrown. There's no king anymore. The people, they're out. You know, the, the temple's destroyed. They're going to recognize that we need him at this time. Now, for us, maybe it's not going to be quite as dramatic. You know, we're not, hopefully, going to be invaded by conquerors and, you know, but uh, who knows these days, right? We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But there will be seasons in our life where we maybe have that extra de dependence. But even when things are going good, we need to remind ourselves, hey, we still need him. Even when, we, you know, people say, how can I pray for you? Maybe you've had that. Hopefully you have had these times. Say, how, so how can I pray for you? You're like, I, I don't know. 
But a prayer request doesn't just need to be about something, quote, negative. Does everybody realize that? When we pray, it's not just all the bad stuff that might be going on for me or for somebody else. Prayer should also be praise. Prayer should also be lifting God up for his mighty works and what he's doing in our lives. So when things are looking up, look up as well and give them thanks. And when times are tough, we recognize even further our dependence on him. But verse 27 starts, and this will look similar to what we see in the Psalms. If you recall, we just did that whole sermon series on the Psalms. It starts with this statement, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by God? The way that question is phrased, it's phrased in a way to say that you haven't been forgotten about. But it's easy sometimes for us to feel that way, right? But the people had to be reminded, just as we got to be reminded, that God didn't stop listening. Sometimes I can't make sense of God. I can't. Eventually I do. And I've you know, made this point and made it recently. That sometimes when we are confused, has anybody ever been confused about a situation? And then later on, it might be a week, a month, maybe even years later, you're like, ah, now that makes sense. Anybody? So when you're going through the thick of something, don't tell yourself, oh, this is never going to make sense. It might. Frequently it does. I'd say the majority of time it does. Sometimes, though, it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. And that's really where faith comes in. Where we have to recognize, again, our dependence on him, and we have to be okay with the fact that we might not ever have answers to the side of the grave, but the world will keep turning. So he didn't stop listening. He's still ever-present. And we still bring our petitions to him. Even if we're frustrated with God, even if we're weak and we're weary, we need to continue to bring those petitions to him and not relent. And we can say what we want about the Jewish people. You know, we could say that they were knuckleheads at times. But they continued on a whole to trust, even after they fell, that God's not done with us. He's going to honor those unconditional covenants that he made with Abraham, with Noah, and today in our context with the new covenant with Jesus Christ and the promises of God that flow from the new covenant. Point number two from verses 28 through 29, reassurances of God's power. So again, we have these questions posed in the passage. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The question, it's kind of rhetorical, obviously, with the implication, you do know. You have heard. You do, you could almost read it this way. You do know and you have heard that the Lord is the everlasting God and the creators of the ends of the earth, and he's not going to grow weary. Folks, you know this. You might not always feel it, and I'm a big fan of if we feel a way that we ought to articulate that, but our feelings don't always dictate reality, do they? Do they? That's why we, we have, you know, God creates us as emotional people, but sometimes we got to step back from the heat of that emotion and remind ourselves that he's still on the throne because we do know and we have heard that he is our everlasting God. So we got to remind ourselves, point number two, next slide, we got to remind ourselves at times, of who he is. Israel had to do that when they were going through the thick of this situation. We have to remind ourselves of what he's done throughout history. I mean, even just creation. I, if you ever, like, want to just sit and be in awe, now the whole world was in awe. What was it, last Sunday or Monday? Or a big, a decent chunk of it. How have you sat out there with you for the eclipse? Off and on. Now, where I was, where we were in Florida last week, if you didn't even tell me eclipse was happening, I wouldn't have known because we weren't in the, anywhere near the path of totality, as they called it. I know some of you might have traveled down to the path of totality, and it was 
I saw some of the pictures, even from some of you and other friends. It was cool, wasn't it? How many, how many of you saw some? Sandy, you guys drove down here. Was it pretty cool? She's giving a big thumbs up. But we see different stuff like this, and it's awe-inspiring, that, and we even can pinpoint when it's going to happen next. You know, you might have saw, like, some flashback pictures of the last time it happened and say, in the 70s or whatever for this particular type of eclipse. We have different kinds, but next time will be in 2024. When's the next one? 2000 what? 40 something? 44, 2044. And we can pinpoint it with precision when that's going to happen, which goes to the fine-tuning of the universe. And when I talk about the universe, this is just a small, tiny little speck of the universe. Have you ever thought about, have you ever, like, when I was a little kid, I thought the universe was like our solar system with the plant, planets. That is a tiny, 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 tiny little part of the universe. There could be, like, endless galaxy, galaxies out there, and you hear about millions of light years away. I mean, that boggles the mind. To get, you know, we talk about three million light years away. That's something moving at the speed of light. Moving at the speed of light, it would take three million years to get there. That's some crazy stuff, but it's pretty neat. And yet here we are in our little neck of the woods in the universe where the conditions are just right for everything that we see around us. If the sun was just a hair off, if the moon was just a hair off, none of this would be possible. That's awe-inspiring. Lori, she knows I'm into this stuff. She used to buy me, like, DVDs. Remember DVDs? Remember when those were a thing? Remember that? But anyway, she used to buy me DVDs of, like, the universe and stuff like that. I used to watch those shows. I still do. I can't sleep at 2 a.m. and flipping through the channels, and there's some space show on. I'm watching that because that's cool. So you think about what God has done from creation and his, cre you know, his local creation here, like everything that we see around us, it's awe-inspiring. It's like we don't worship the creation, but we ought to respect it and honor it and see it because it's a cool thing that God has done. And people and humanity. and So we remind ourselves what God has done, and we see in the last several thousand years what he's done in biblical history and throughout church history. And we see his hand of provision and protection upon his people. So we need to remind ourselves of that history. And I've talked about this. We need to remind ourselves what he's done for us. You need to do an inventory every so often of all the big blessings of God in your life, how he's always been faithful. You know, I talk about how the Israelites were knuckleheads. I, I get a kick out of them in the book of Numbers. They're whining. What's God doing? I mean, he's appearing, you know, in this cloud that's guiding them and fire and, you know. This is my favorite, raining down manna from heaven. He is feeding them heavenly food, and they're still complaining because they're getting sick of eating it. It's like, what do you want, filet mignon? Lobster tail from the heavens? I mean, what, this isn't good enough? It's not supernatural enough for you because you're bored? Where's God? Let's go worship an idol right now. Let's go build our golden calf. And we can laugh at that and say, oh, that's, we would never. We always, it's always a we would never in hindsight. We would never do that. We would never act like the Pharisees, but then what do we do? We act like Israelites and Pharisees. History has a way of repeating itself. We've got to be on guard and alert to make sure that we don't replicate those same mistakes. However, yet even in the mistakes of God's people, he was faithful to them and through his promises. So I want you to sit back one day, sometime this week, maybe today. It's a nice day. Go sit on your porch or Take a walk, I don't know, whatever you do to relax. For me, it's sitting out on my deck. Hopefully the sun will still be out with a Diet Pop or Coke Zero. That sounds great right now. That's probably what I'll do. And to reflect on the good things that God has done. 
And when we are tempted to say, well, where's God at right now? He's taking too long, or this isn't the what. I didn't envision it this way. And these are all, again, normal human emotions. We ought to articulate them. We ought not coach people to hold that stuff in. The psalmist certainly did it. The prophets, they lay it out there. We need to lay it out there as well. But we also need to remind ourselves of what he's done. And then, and then be excited for what he's going to do. Again, we're people who, people need hope. We need to have something to look forward to. So even if you're in a situation right now, you're like, I don't know what my next career move is. I feel stuck. If you're young, I don't know what I'm going to go to college for. That seems intimidating. I don't know what my next, what ministry I should sign up for. I, but, you know, when you have those feelings, flip them and remind yourself that something is coming. And I can be excited for that. I don't know what it is right now, but I'm going to be excited for whatever it is that God is going to do through my life. I wish it was happening this second. That's fine. That's okay to admit that. But he's going to move and he's going to act. And I'm going to look forward to seeing how God is going to move. Point number three. This is a tough one. Trusting in God's timing, verses 30 through 31. You know, we want to store with the eagles now, right? Eagle, come swoop me up and let me fly. Because right now I feel like I'm going at a snail's pace. I'm tired of being a snail. I want to be with the eagles. Now, I'm not like a bird expert or an eagle expert, but I know that eagles can be a bit strategic. They're not just swooping down at food at any given moment, you know? There's no crazy eagles out there just running into buildings generally. The eagle's going to wait for the right time to get its food, to go to its next destination. There's timing with the eagle. There's timing, uh, God's timing with us. And we always say, you know, you maybe have heard, I've said it too, that God does answer every prayer. He just answers it yes but sometimes no, and sometimes wait. I don't know about you, but the wait sometimes almost is more annoying than the no. Because at least with the no, I mean, that's a bummer, but I got an answer. Okay, well, that didn't pan out. But it's when you're sitting in limbo, or God is telling you just to hang tight or to wait. That is not fun, is it? I mean, we live in a world where if we want something, we get it right away. Remember back when phones were just phones and used to call people? And now you can click a button and you're going to have Starbucks at your door in five seconds. You're going to send an email to somebody across the world. Remember back when we needed information? We actually had to go to like a library or a book or an encyclopedia and like open that thing and look for it. We couldn't just like go to Google. Do you remember that? I remember growing up as a little kid with the, the Dewey Decimal System and the card catalog for young. Is that still a thing even? Is that, is that a thing anymore? It is? It's still out there? The Dewey? Okay. Did not know that. Well, you get my point. We're able to do things a lot quicker than we are ever able to do. I mean, if you just look at the, how society changed from 1870 to 1920, there was major huge changes. Can you imagine growing up back then? Like, let's say you were born like in like 1850 and you lived through the Civil War. And let's say you lived to be like 90 years old or something to like the beginning of World War II. Think of everything that you saw happen. Think of all the, you know, there's like electricity, lights, cars, radio. But then think about, for, for those of you, maybe there's some people here that say, oh, yeah, I remember back before TVs were much of a thing. 
And now we got Google and DoorDash and, and everything else. My point is this. Waiting is tough, particularly in a quickly moving, ever-changing society where we're used to having everything instantly. God doesn't operate on that kind of timetable. What does he say? What, what does uh, Peter say? That a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. We see that concept in both the Old and the New Testament. Isaiah says, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. We tend to think we have it all figured out, but sometimes his ways are different. And sometimes when he's shaping us and forming us, we are, we're having to wait. And waiting is not a passive exercise. Waiting is something that requires trust. And it requires patience. Is there, who, who in here, I, a real question. Who says, I'm really gifted at patience? Anybody? All right, we got like one person out of how many here? Most of us are, are not inherently patient people. But we sit and we wait and trust in God's timing. Totally unrelated to anything I just talked about, but I, I said something about 90 years, and somebody in here today is turning 89 years old. Can we give a little happy birthday shout out to Ralph Schultz, who we love and appreciate? <laughs> Ralph is the toughest 89 year old dude I have ever met. And we appreciate him a great deal and his years of ministry in this church and everything that he's done here. Always, almost always the first person you see in the door. And I mean, I mean, I've seen Ralph out there lifting things and doing things and just. We love you, and we appreciate you, Ralph, and I hope you have a very happy birthday. And one more round of applause for Ralph. Here's another challenge, waiting exercises. Maybe do a little, do a little uh, exercise for yourself and the things that you know that you want or that you feel God is calling you to or whatever, but there is that time of preparation. And even you look at biblical examples. The Apostle Paul didn't just have his road to Damascus, Damascus experience. And he's like, oh, I'm going to go on three missionary journeys. There was years of preparation, if you read the text closely, that took place. I get a kick out of when I, when I deal with, you know, maybe young people coming right out of college, whether they're going into ministry or the secular field. They want all the, the stuff that somebody's had to work for for 20, 30, 40 years, and they want it today. It doesn't happen that way. For those of you in here who have achieved success, it didn't just get thrown in your lap. There was waiting, and there was patience, and there was hard work, and there was persistence, and there was ups and downs, and you really, going back to that dependence on God, you had to trust in him. And sometimes we, we just, we want to do something, because if we do something, we feel like we're taking control. If we have more control of the situation, we have less anxiety. But we need to learn to trust, sometimes just to be still. One of the most comforting passages of Scripture, but one of the biggest challenges, be still and know that I am God. I don't know, you probably know this, I don't do good being still. I haven't done good being still during this message. That's just how I roll. So that's a challenge for a lot of us, to be still and know that he is God, to know that he is sovereign, know that he is in control, and to be patient. Point number four, a response of renewed strength. So the people are weary and they're tired. They're in Babylonian captivity, and that's going to be going on a while. But we have a promise in verses 29 through 31. He's going to give strength to the weary. He's going to increase the power of the weak. We see even youths grow tired. We think, well, you know, I'm older. These young people have got all the energy. No, young people get tired too. I've ran races. I've run competitively. I train hard. I would like to think I'm still in pretty good shape now. You put me out there in a 5 or 10K, I'm going to be tired afterwards. But there's that time of restoration that takes place. And we look at the overall story of Israel. God restores Israel and never restore them the way that they were looking for or wanting. We see that in the, in the New Testament. 
even when the disciples are with Jesus and they're saying, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel right now? He had a bigger plan. He had a better plan. Well, that's what they were waiting for and wanting. But Israel was restored. God has moved actively in his people throughout the ages. There's been times where the church in various parts of the world or collectively has felt beat up or bogged down, particularly in those early centuries when it was facing intense persecution. The church would find restoration. Individuals find restoration. Even those who live a long life, and as that life goes on, the body begins to break down for a lot of people. And they're tired and they're weary, and we'll pray sometimes for somebody's healing. And God doesn't heal them the way that we maybe sometimes want, but he heals them in a much grander and bigger way. A healing unto death where they are then with Christ in paradise, looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. So even in death, for the believer, it's not the last chapter. Ironically, for the believer, death, just like with the cross we talked about in Easter a couple weeks ago, we turned a symbol of shame into a symbol of triumph. We took death, and through death came victory and redemption. So God restores. God gives vision. There are times in life that we feel like we lack vision or we're tired. But God is there for us. He restores and he, he begins new chapters. You know, I'm tired, folks. I've been doing this for 23 years since I was 20 years old. Every single Sunday, except for on my vacation, traveling down to some sunny place. Other than that, other than that, since I was 20 years old, every single week, I've been on staff at a church since May of 2001. Started out as a student pastor. Did that in a couple churches for about a year and a half. And then since December 29th of 2002, I've been in what we call full-time ministry. Most pastors throughout their, you know, I've been, so I've been doing that full-time for, you know, 21, but 24 overall. Most pastors don't make it that long in this day and age. You look at the studies, you look at the statistics, most of them burn out, they quit, they do whatever. Uh, there's some that go quite a bit longer. But even for most ministers, there is a time of sabbatical or break or whether it's at their current assignment or between churches. I've never had that. I do need that now. So I'm letting you know that this will be my last year with you. At some point, as early as fall, but... Up till the end of the year, if need be, I'm going to continue to serve with you. But I need that downtime. I don't know what that next chapter for me will look like, but I am excited for it. And hopefully nobody's super bummed out at the second. Um, but as we just talked about, new beginnings, new chapters provide new opportunities. So I'm not going anywhere anytime you know, immediately. I'll be here next week, next month. But we'll begin that process. I've talked with our church leadership team. We'll begin that process of that next chapter. Um, and whoever comes in after me, I hope you throw your full and complete support behind that person. And I hope you look at it as a new, fresh beginning, a new opportunity. In the last 14 years, I've like to think I've accomplished a, a good deal. But, and, and I know this too, there is nothing wrong. I love the church here. My family loves the church. It's the only church Little Bill's ever known. That's it, I'm here. Certainly David too, right? I spent the majority of my ministry here, the majority of my adult life. When I came here, I was 29 years old. I was a month away from turning 30. This fall, I'm going to be 44. Church has had a huge impact in my life and in my family. But sometimes it's just time. And that's the leading I feel of God. But it's, trust me, guys, it's nothing negative. We love you guys. We love it here. And I'm looking forward to every remaining week that I continue to be with you. 
but look at it as an opportunity for whatever comes next, for the next chapter of this church. And I'm asking everybody here, stick with the ministry of this church. Stick with me as long as I'm here with you, but stick with the transition team after that. Stick with the next pastor. This church has so much immense potential. And I'm asking every person that's here today or that could be watching or learns about this later on, stay with Royal Oak Church and be a part of what's going to come next and be excited for that and be excited for what God's going to do. So in conclusion, I say, embrace new chapters. This is tough for me. Didn't look forward to this part of the service, but I wanted to let you all know, and I covet your prayers in the, in the coming months. Uh, leadership team and I, we spoke yesterday. Um, for those in the leadership team that are here, I think some requested to, that we kind of end our service in prayer. So if there's uh, members of our leadership team that want to come down here, I don't think everybody's here today. I think only maybe a couple people. Um, yeah. Uh, George, I see you. Come if you want. Todd, Susan. We got half the gang here. Me, we got a majority. But we're going we're gonna to conclude our service with prayer, and I hope you guys enjoy this beautiful day. And remember, let's embrace these new chapters and celebrate what God's going to do. I'll hand this off to George. I'll give it to you. Now you got me doing it. <laughs> Can we all stand, please? Let's remember that there's changes like you said in our lives. A lot of us have been through a lot of different things, but we all serve a, gra a great and wonderful, awesome God, don't we? You know, and we don't know what the future is. For all we know, the Lord might come back before the last message Bill gives. We don't know what the tomorrow holds, and, you know, who knows? But let's pray for Bill and his glory and young Bill and David, that God will give them clear insight for what is next in their lives and what's next for us. Because each day should be a new adventure. Some days it's we don't want to get out of bed. Anybody amen on that one? <laughs> you know, but let's trust God and let's go before him now and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you at this time, for what you've done in all of our lives, the great salvation that you've given to us, things are changing, I know, in all of our lives. Some of us, are, our bodies are given out, things are changing, and some, there's a new growth. We see little David growing. We just ask for your blessing upon Bill and Lori and young Bill and David, and God, and direct them. And keep your hand, because we know you're not done with them. We mean, you know, I, I knew this, you know, coming up, and I've struggled with a little bit. God, hey, God, you sure? You know, I'd say, Bill, you sure? You know, but we know that we have to trust you by faith and just totally depend on you. We pray you support them. We pray for your future here at Rock Church, Lord, that you'll guide us and help us all be the light you've called us to do and give us all a new beginning this day because every day we need to be a light for you. We thank you for your love and all you've done for us. In your great name, Jesus' name, amen. We'll conclude our service at this time. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for Royal Oak Church. I know I thank you for everything this church has meant to me for so many years and so many of the rest of us. And I pray that we would be excited for whatever comes next for Royal Oak Church and for us as individuals in our individual lives. And we just pray that your will would be done. We place all these things in your hands. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you all. That concludes our service. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. I'm still going to be here for a while, but I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful, blessed day.